Histology is the study of tissues. So in this chapter, we're going to learn about the different types of tissues and what the origin of those tissues is. We'll talk about how tissues are sailed together, the importance and the locations of some of those junctions that hold tissues together. We'll look at some of the similarities and the differences between the four primary classifications of tissue in the human body, learn about the structure and function of membranes that are made up of tissue, and then get a basic understanding of how tissues repair themselves when there's damage. So to begin with, we need to talk about what a tissue is. So a tissue is a group of cells that usually has a similar embryological origin, and they're specialized for a particular function. The nature of the extracellular material that surrounds the connections between the cells of a tissue influence the structure and the properties of a specific tissue. So their structure and their function allows them to carry out very specialized activities. So we'll look at the four basic types and keep in mind that they are classified based on their structure and their function, the type of cells that make up that tissue and what the tissue does. So depending on their function and structure, the various tissues of the human body are classified into four principal types. Epithelial tissues, which cover body surfaces and line hollow organs, line body cavities and ducts or passageways through the body, and they also form glands. Connective tissues protect and support the body and its organs, bind organs together, store energy as fat, and also helps to provide immunity in the human body. Muscle tissue, the job of a muscle is to contract, and when it does so, it can either move the body or move something within the body, help generate force, and also cause heat to be generated in the body. Think about what happens when you get cold, your muscles shiver. Have you ever wondered why, why you shiver? We'll find out more about that. And then the fourth classification is the nervous tissue, which initiates and transmits action potentials, or what we commonly call nerve impulses, that help coordinate movements of the human body. All right, so four major classifications of tissue. We'll look at each one of these briefly and look at some examples of them. But we have to understand what holds tissues together. So cell junctions are point of contact between the membranes of cells that are close together and make up tissue. So the cell junctions, being those points of contact, are going to determine how those cells interact with each other and how they hold together. Depending on their structure, cell junctions typically will function uh, in one of three ways. Some are going to form very tight junctions, sort of a fluid resistant or fluid tight seal between cells. Others will sort of anchor cells together or anchor the cells to the surrounding material and others may act as channels which allow ions and molecules to pass back and forth from cell to cell within a tissue. So let's examine each one of these types of junctions now. The most important kind of junctions between cells are tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions, the ones that we just mentioned. Tight junctions are going to form sort of a watertight barrier uh, that allows some things to move across and, and other things not to be able to. So they form sort of seals between cells and are very common in epithelial cells that line the stomach, the intestines, and the urinary bladder. You also find a lot of these making up the blood-brain barrier. Now when I say waterproof or forming seal, that doesn't mean that nothing gets across from cell to cell, but it means that few things get across. So small molecules uh, and some ions and different things can get through these, but it does provide sort of a protection. And you don't want urine leaking out of the urinary bladder and out into your abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, the blood-brain barrier, very tightly held together cells so that some things can get into the brain, the fluids of the brain, and some things can't. So these provide very close, tight junctions holding cells together. Desmosomes are sometimes where uh, are found where there's a lot of stress or a lot of pulling. So they're composed of plaques and transmembrane glycoproteins. Well, that's a big old word. Transmembrane means across the membrane. Glycoprotein means sugar protein. So these sort of form a spot weld between adjacent cell membranes 
and link the cytoskeleton of cells together. So again, you find this where you have a lot of pulling and a lot of stretching in tissues. Think about what your skin is doing. It's covering your body and every time you move, you contract a muscle or you move around in the environment around you, your skin is moving and being pulled and tugged on as those muscles contract and as you twist and turn and bend. And from the time your heart starts beating until the time you die, those muscle cells are contracting and pulling against each other. So we have these little spot welds that hold those cells very tightly together. The third type of junction are gap junctions. Gap junctions allow cells in a tissue to communicate rapidly through little holes called connexins. So these are sort of like little channels that run from one cell to another cell and allow ions and other things to cross from cell to cell. These are also very important in your heart, in your cardiac muscle tissue, because not all of those cells are going to be a part of the machinery that keeps your heart beating. Some of them are going to be what we call autorhythmic cells, and they're going to depolarize and cause the heart muscle to contract. But not all of the cells can do that. So these little connexins or gap junctions allow ions to flow from one cell into another cell so that all the muscles can do what they need to. They can uh, contract as a unit. Okay, so now that we've seen some of the junctions or connections between cells, let's look at some differences between two of our big categories of tissue, so the epithelials and the connective tissue. So there are major structural differences between epithelials and connective tissue. One is the number of cells in relation to the extracellular matrix. So in epithelial tissues, as you can see here in this first image, all of these cells are very, very tightly packed together with very little matrix or stuff outside the cell, okay? So cells are very, very tight together. There's not a lot of stuff in between them. When you look at connective tissues, you've got a lot of extracellular material that's going to be found between the cells. Okay, so here you have a cell, here's a cell, here's a cell. All these stringy things are fibers. Okay, so a lots of goo or extracellular matrix between the two. So very easy to see the difference in this. Another difference you'll see between epithelials and connective tissues, most epithelial tissues have a very, very poor or no blood supply, so it lacks blood vessels. Your connective tissues usually have a significant network of blood vessels coming in. So as we continue to talk about these tissues, you'll see uh, that these epithelial tissues receive nutrients very differently, and sometimes when you've got layers and layers and layers of epithelial tissues, some of them are just going to start dying simply because there's no vascular supply or no blood supply coming in to bring nutrients and oxygens. Also, epithelial tissues usually form the surface layers, and in most cases, they're not covered by other tissue. So major differences of connective and epithelials. Your epithelials, remember, are usually tightly packed. Your connectives, just a few cells with a whole lot of matrix. Your epithelials tend to be avascular or poor blood supply. Your connective tissues, usually pretty blood rich, and then your epithelials form coverings and external layers uh, and are usually not covered by a different type of tissue and your connective tissues a lot of times are surrounded by other types of tissues. So let's look now specifically at epithelial tissues. So some of the general features of epithelial tissues is that they're usually arranged in sheets, either single or multiple layers and very, very densely or tightly packed together. Epithelial tissue consists mostly of packed, packed cells with very little extracellular matrix. The cell junctions are present, providing very secure attachments between cells. Epithelial cells will also have an apical or free surface and attach to a basal or basement surface, such as a basement membrane. We'll see an image in just a minute that shows us that. Your epithelial tissues adhere firmly to nearby connective tissues with a thin extracellular layer that we call the basement membrane. And that's going to be that bottom layer or deepest layer of most of your epithelials. Epithelials are avascular or have a very poor blood supply. Um, 
but they usually do have a pretty good nervous tissue supply. So with that epithelial tissue being avascular, then nutrients and oxygen have to diffuse or move from one tissue type into another, usually from connective tissues into the epithelial tissues. And epithelial tissues are very highly mitotic, which simply means that they can undergo mitosis very frequently, uh, and that's how they continue to renew themselves. So here you can see typical epithelial tissue in this picture. So these are epithelial cells. This upper part is the apical or the apex. So that's the free surface. So this would be like the inside lining of your stomach or your digestive organs, okay? If you're thinking about epithelial tissues making up your skin, this would be the external part, the skin part that you see. Here you've got that basement membrane made up of two layers known as the basal lamina and the reticular lamina, so those make up the basement membrane that simply connects your epithelial tissues to the connective tissues below. So remember, we've got nervous tissue coming in to supply those epithelial tissues, but the vascular system is typically going to be found below the epithelials down in the connective tissues. So nutrients and oxygen and such will diffuse from the vascular system down here in the connective tissues up into some of the epithelials. We classify epithelial tissues based on the the shape of the cells that make up the epithelials, and also how many layers are these cells arranged in. So cell shape is pretty straightforward, okay? So what does the cell look like? If the cell is flat, sort of like a, a fried egg that you put in a pan, those cells are called squamous or squamous. So I always tell students, just think of squamous as squished. Your cuboidals, everyone knows what a cube is. It's a little square shape. So cuboidal epithelial are somewhat cube or box shaped. And then columnar is long and slender, shaped very much like a column. So remember, these are epithelial cells. Oh, sorry about that. Epithelial cells, so each layer is, uh, or each tissue is going to be attached to a basement membrane and have an apical or free surface. So that's classification based on cell shape. If you see at the top of the page, you have different numbers of layers of cells. So when we classify epithelial cells based on the number of layers, simple is always going to refer to one layer. So here we have simple epithelial cells, and you can see they are somewhat boxy looking or cubed. So those would be simple cuboidal epithelial cells. We also look at uh, whether or not there are, there's more than one layer. So simple is one layer. Stratified means you have more than one layer of epithelial cells. So it may be two layers. It may be 10, 20, or 30 layers. Stratified, a stratum or a strata means layer. So you're still going to have the bottom layer attached to the basement membrane. You're still going to have a free surface. So this would be stratified cuboidal, there's your basement membrane, there's your apical surface. And then we have a third type that is known as pseudo-stratified. Pseudo simply means false, so falsely stratified. And it's not that these cells are stratified, it's just that they appear stratified. You can see that these cells all attach to the basement membrane and they all come up to the apical surface and there's just one layer of cells here. Now these cells are usually packed very tightly together, so sometimes the cytoplasm or the goo inside the cell and the nucleus get really squishy. So they all do attach and go up to the free surface, but because of the way they're so tightly packed in there, they appear to be layered. We will have a separate video and a separate PowerPoint that looks at many of the different types of tissue with some images as well as their function and location. So you'll get more information about simple cuboidal and stratified squamous. So again, be sure that you see that next video so that we can get that covered for you as well. If you remember when we first mentioned epithelial cells, we talked about some of those cells may come together to form tissues that are going to create little organs we call glands. 
So a general feature of a gland is that it is going to secrete something, so it's secreting a product. We have some different categories that we label glands. An endocrine gland is ductless, which means it does not have a duct or a passageway. The secretory products enter the extracellular fluid and then diffuse into the bloodstream. So your um, adrenal glands, your pancreas, your thyroid, um, many other glands that you'll learn when you do the endocrine system secrete their products, which we call hormones, into the fluids around the cells and then it moves into the bloodstream and travels throughout the body where it finds targets. So that hormone is the secretion being secreted basically you could say into the bloodstream. In comparison to that, an exocrine gland such as your sweat glands, your oil glands, some of your digestive glands secrete their products into ducts or tubes that empty the gland onto a surface or a covering or the lining epithelial layer. So your salivary glands secrete into your mouth, which is lined with epithelial cells. Um, some of your digestive organs secrete hormones into the passageways, such as the lumen of the stomach or into the small intestine. So endocrine secretes into the bloodstream, not through a duct. Exocrine secre secretes through a duct into a passageway or onto a body surface. So this gives you a little bit more information about each of those. Okay, so here you have your thyroid gland made up of epithelial tissues and it's going to secrete from these cells into the extracellular space. You can see better over here in the cartoony image and then it's going to get soaked up right into that blood vessel. So here on this image that would be a blood vessel, here would be a blood vessel. So when the thyroid gland secretes its hormones, it travels through the blood vessels out to body tissues. So examples of this include the pituitary gland, the pineal gland, which regulates your sleep, the thyroid and the parathyroid that are located near the larynx, which is what we commonly call the voice box. Yes, you heard me right. I said larynx. I didn't say larynx. You don't have a larynx. Everybody's going to say it that way, but the right way is larynx. Same thing with pharynx. You don't have a pharynx. You have a pharynx. Yeah, sometimes we just sort of have these little things we get OCD about when you teach. Okay. All right. So the adrenal glands are going to sit superior to or on top of the kidneys, and they're going to secrete hormones. And remember, the hormones are chemical messengers that are going to have metabolic properties and cause things to happen inside cells that help us to maintain homeostasis. Your exocrine glands, again, are going to secrete their products through a duct onto a surface of a covering or something uh, or lining epithelium, such as the epithelial cells that line your digestive system, or onto body surfaces, such as secreting onto the skin or into the mouth. So your sweat glands, your oil glands, your cerumen, cer, uh, ceruminous glands that secrete your earwax, digestive glands such as your salivary glands and your pancreas, uh, <coughs> excuse me, all of these are going to secrete through a duct or a tubular passageway onto a surface. So the function of these exocrine glands is really going to depend on what type of gland it is that's secreting it. So these help to lower your body temperature by secreting sweat onto a body surface so that heat can uh, dissipate away from the body. Your oil glands secreting uh, a oily product onto your hair to keep it moisturized and your salivary glands secreting into the mouth so you can lubricate your food. So you'll learn more and more about these as you go on, uh, but just some examples of these endocrine glands. Now remember, these are made up of epithelial tissues. So you can see here, there's epithelial tissues, that dark around the outer edge there, that reddish color, that's going to be the basement membrane those epithelials are attached to. And here you can see a hole in the middle, that's going to be the apical or free surface. So that's the lumen or the opening of a sweat gland. So that sweat would be secreted into that opening and then out onto a body surface. 
So further classification of the glands, we talked about how they secrete and what they secrete, but we also can classify them based on the number of cells that make up that particular tissue or that particular gland. So unicellular, uni means one, unicellular glands made up of singular cells are typically going to be called goblet cells and they're usually going to secrete mucus onto a surface. So you find lots of goblet cells in the digestive system secreting a mucousy solution out into the intestine. Multicellular glands are composed of many cells and they have very distinctive microscopic or macroscopic structure. Okay, so small or large. When you look at these, as we will in the next picture, you see here, this is a singular tubular gland and there's your duct. There's a branched tubular gland, and there's your duct. Here's coiled. So you can see that regardless how they look, they all have the same characteristics. They're made up of epithelial cells. They're going to secrete into a duct or a passageway onto a body surface. And then finally, we'll look at functional classifications of the glands. So a merocrine is a gland that is going to secrete the products and discharge it by a process called exocytosis. So this is a good time to look at what words mean. Exo means to exit or outside. Site means cell. Osis is condition. Okay, so exit the cell condition. Getting stuff out of the cell. So this is how your salivary glands work. They are merocrine glands. So the saliva is created inside the cell, packaged into little bags, transport bags that we call vesicles, and then those vesicles fuse with the cell membrane and the secretion comes out. So secreting a product by exocytosis, take it out of the cell. The mammary glands are a type of apocrine gland. So these accumulate their secretory processes usually at the uh, apical surface of the secreting cell, then a portion of the cell sort of pinches off from the rest of the cell to form the secretion. And the remaining part of the cell then repairs itself and continues the process. So we form the secretion down here and package it up as best we can. And then the cell starts sort of pinching a piece of itself off. Okay, see so here's what's happening. That portion that's pinched off is then secreted out of the tissue. Just like we see up here, but instead of secreting out just the product, part of the cell is coming off as well. So your apocrine, apocrine secretions, part of the cell is pinched off as a part of the secretion. And then the third type is the holocrine secretion. This is where the secretory products accumulate in the cytosol and when the cell dies, both the cell and its parts are discharged as the glandular secretion. With the discharged cell or the dead cell that's being uh, secreted is going to be replaced by a new cell being made. So here you see the cell, it's making its product and these, putting it in these little vesicles up here and all the vesicles are accumulating. The cell starts to die and the entire cell is going to be part of the secretion. And then, of course, that cell is going to be replaced by making new cells. So this is how our oil glands or sebaceous glands within the skin are going to secrete that product out onto the surface. Okay, so that gives us an overview of epithelial tissues. In our next video, we'll begin looking at different types of connective tissues.